Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the New York Times debate at the Climate Hub. Welcome to those of you who are here and those of you who are joining from screens everywhere. My name is Somini Sangupta. I'm a reporter with the New York Times. I'll be uh, joined here by my co-moderator, Krishnan Gurumurthy, from uh, Channel 4 News. So we are going to be debating um, a topic that's really at the intersection of two of the most important currents in the world today. One, climate change is making it harder for people around the world in many places to make a living, indeed to live where they live. And climate change is uh, acting as a threat multiplier, exacerbating conflict risks in many parts of the world. And then on the other hand, we live in a time when many countries are increasingly closing their borders. They're increasingly unwelcome for people who are fleeing war and persecution to say nothing of those who are forcibly displaced by climate impacts. So the topic of our debate today um, is whether migration is a sound adaptation strategy for those who are feeling the most acute impacts of climate change, and indeed whether it's a form of reparations from the industrialized countries of the global north, whose historic emissions are principally responsible for this problem, to those in the global south who are feeling its most acute impacts. So this is doubtless going to be a tough debate. Uh, we've got some excellent debaters, and we really hope that you will listen to the arguments closely on both sides and that it will help you to think more deeply about the subject. Krish? Indeed, this is obviously a debate topic that is in the news here in this country every day as people arrive on the southern shores of Britain, many from the global south uh, and many from countries already affected by climate change and where climate change is a factor in conflicts in their countries. It's a, it's a fairly simple debate format, so let me just run through how it's going to work. I'll be calling on two teams of debaters. There are three on each side. They will each have four minutes to speak. Some of them are here in person. Some of them will be joining us virtually. Um, and they will come up uh, in pairs um, to the stage, and we'll hear them in rounds. After we've heard from all six debaters, and I should say this is not a sort of parliamentary debate, I'm afraid. It's, there are no interventions or points of information. Um, I will be asking um, three very eminent judges to offer some constructive commentary uh, on what they've heard, or perhaps they'll just pull the whole thing apart and destroy it. And then based on the judges' feedback, the teams will draft their closing remarks and work out between themselves in a very quick one and a half minutes who is going to present their closing arguments um, they will come back with their reflections, and then it will be over to you in the audience, um, not to vote, I'm afraid, we, we don't want to do anything so dangerously democratic, but um, the, the, the winner will be decided by the strength and, uh, and, and loudness of your applause for each side, and then we will declare a winner. Time is of the essence in this debate. We will be pretty brutal about enforcing those times. So let's get on to our first, uh, our first round of uh, two debaters, and I'll introduce them both um, first of all. Um, we're going to be hearing from Dr. Deb Morrison, who is speaking for the motion, which let me remind you is that migration is a sound adaptation and reparations strategy. Deb is a climate and anti-oppression activist, scientist, and educator and is here in person, I'm delighted to say. Um, and against the motion that migration is a sound adaptation and reparations strategy will be Francois Germain, who is Senior Research Associate and Director of the Hugo Observatory at the University of Liège. So first of all, to propose the motion to speak for it, um, please welcome Deb Morrison. I'm not sure if it's good morning or good afternoon, but I'm sure it's good evening somewhere in the world as well. So migration is happening now. We don't actually even have to have a debate about whether it's a sound adaptation or reparation strategy, because it simply is. 
Equitable and just migration is really what we should be talking about. How do we think about the need to account for community level migration and not solely individual migration? To ensure that we have justice in the movement of migration spaces, we need to think about whole communities maintaining cultural integrity as they're displaced from their ancestral homelands and as a stopgap measure, hopefully, to be repatriated in the future. We need to acknowledge that the shifts in, in humanity and work holistically with communities. And we also need, in this moment, to understand that there is a responsibility that the wealthier parts of the world must bear in the costs and in the, the strategies in working collectively with communities. There is an enormous, I think it's one third of the carbon contributed to the atmosphere is from the United States. Well, one third of the climate refugees and the cost of migrating people in place needs to be borne as well, um, and equally by other nations in the world. Thinking about what it means to do this is also about justice of a rights-based migration strategy. So we need to think about how we're making decisions about who's migrating, where they're migrating to, and what new arrangements of governance and, and place have to be made. Because there's an intersectional issue of justice when it comes to migration. If you're migrating from somewhere because of climate challenges, you're migrating to somewhere where somebody has lived, usually for, my, for millennia. And we see this a lot in the North American context, where people have been migrating in for centuries into the homelands of indigenous peoples. In Australia and New Zealand, we've seen this too. So as we're doing migration, um, again, I think migration is a sound strategy simply because it is. And it, to make it most sound, we need to consider these issues of rights-based processes. One of the things that I think will help us in this work is in Article 6 of the Convention, Article 12 of the Paris Agreement, we have a lovely little thing that's being renegotiated this time around, which is um, called the Doha Work Pro Program for the Action for Climate Empowerment Program in the United Nations. The reason this is critical is because part of that program says in it that public participation is part of all work in climate change. And what do we mean when we say public participation? Well, you need to tell your negotiators that you mean a rights-based method of climate public participation, so that in these migrations, as people move and shift, we can ensure that people are making decisions about their own lives, about their own cultures and communities. And through the other aspects of the ACE program, through things like education, training, public awareness, public access to information, and international cooperation, which go hand in hand with this public participation piece, in that way, we will actually learn to live together and hopefully find some just ways forward in this climate action. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. And to speak against the motion, Francois Germain. Thanks a lot for having me. Well, until a few years ago, we used to consider migration and displacement as a tragedy, as an uprooting of people who are amongst the most vulnerable to the impacts of climate change. Already in 1990, the IPCC described migration and displacement as one of the worst effects of climate change on population. Last year only, in 2020, more than 30 million people were displaced as a result of extreme events related to climatic conditions. What has happened to the idea that migration and displacement induced by climate change was a tragedy to avoid? What has happened to our duty to protect the most vulnerable people? Now it seems that we have come to consider that migration induced by climate change was a positive thing, could even be considered as a benefit for those who had to move. Let me be clear here. There is no denying that migrants will try and make the best of their migration. 
there is no denying that they will send remittances to their families to support their adaptation. But what else would we expect from them? Do we expect that migrants would abandon their families once they've migrated? I think that when we consider that migration should be an adaptation strategy, we do not consider the full range of impacts that migration has on the migrants themselves, on the trauma of migrating and of being uprooted, on their communities of destination, where they can represent additional demographic pressure on scarce natural resources. And perhaps most importantly, we do not consider enough the impacts of their migration on their communities of origin. Communities of origin who are deprived of essential workforce, of essential resources that could help them adapt and face the, the impacts of climate change. Most importantly, when we consider migration as an adaptation strategy, we consider migrants as commodities, as commodities that we can move from one place to another depending on the needs for adaptation. When we consider that migration should be promoted and an adaptation strategy, what we are doing is betraying the migrants. We are letting down the people we are supposed to protect. We accept, at the end of the day, that some places of the world will become uninhabitable. And yet, the challenge of climate change, the reason why we are here gathered in Glasgow, is to keep the planet inhabitable for all, and in particular for the most vulnerable. That is, my friends, our moral duty. Thank you. Thank you, first round debaters, for staying on time. Our second round comes to us virtually. We have four the motion, Patrick Youssef, Regional Director for Africa for the ICRC, the International Committee uh, of the Red Cross. For against, on the against side, we have Julia Bloker, researcher for the Potsdam Institute for Climate Impacts Research. You both have four minutes each. Thank you. I will start. Um, good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'd like to nuance also my position in, uh, in stemming from our experience from the field as International Committee of the Red Cross and state the following. Um, everyone knows that climate change is affecting us all, but the poorest and the most marginalized communities are the most vulnerable to climate hazards, negative impacts, while their adaptive capacity is extremely, extremely limited. And in our experience in conflict settings, in conflict and war situations, disasters are more likely to lead to displacement than in places where solid institutions focused on reducing risks and people exposure to risks. The recent data that the Internal Displacement Center shows that 10 countries with the highest numbers of newly internally displaced people due to conflict are also experiencing disasters, induced displacements, namely in the Horn of Africa, just to give one example. So displacement can save people's lives, but displacement also tends to make them less safe and to undermine their stability as they lose their assets, their homes, their livelihoods, somehow their connections with their families, their social networks, their social cohesion, and must learn to live in a new environment with limited support for their recovery. And we need here to ensure collectively that people can move if they need to, and if they're protected and can indeed stabilize their situation once they are displaced. I believe that such situations call for more of a holistic analysis, hence here the nuanced reading of the motion. A holistic analysis, prevention measures, and responses. And I feel that disaster displacement is multi-causal with climate change being an important but not the only factor. 
And by the way, it's compounded by other factors such as weak governance, which we never attend to, armed conflicts or urban, uh, very poor urban planning that further weakens the resilience and exacerbates the impacts of disasters. I was recently in the Congos or in Mali and we figure these realities as the daily bread and butter of people living there. So as displacement can be a solution, the ability of communities to adapt to a changing climate and to reduce disaster risks can be strengthened in several ways, even including enduring wars. And I feel that humanitarian and development organizations can also help in formation gaps um, by not only helping communities to develop you know, reliable seasonal crop calendars, for example, but also combine climate data with information available with other models that can take us into the long term. Hence, I think joining forces to respond and address to urgent needs and strengthen the resilience of people in the interim for more durable solution should be explored. Thank you. Thank you very much, and um, it's really a delight to be here and an honor to speak after the preceding speakers. Uh, my main message today is, in the context of climate change, migration as adaptation, which has so far taken a mainly pure economic perspective, will largely widen inequalities between and within countries. Migration is not an accessible or even a desirable response strategy for many of those people who are in desperate need of better climate coping mechanisms. And without significant in-situ adaptation efforts, strengthening existing migration pathways, which really is the only politically viable migration option on the table, will primarily support economic migration of the wealthiest and most educated members of communities and do little to help those peoples who, because of their heightened vulnerabilities, are disproportionately and unfairly affected by climate change. As Mr. Youssef already said, this is marginalized people like women, youth, and minorities. So taking our guiding question today, one that has to then ask adaptation for whom? And to answer this, I'd like to go from the global to, to the local level. So at the international stage, we often hear that it's the world's poorest who bear the brunt of climate change. But then we forget that the world's poorest are also those who have the lowest access to pathways for migration. We could call this a one-two punch. And then looking within climate-prone origin communities, we see that migration requires many different financial with us bear with us until we try to get uh, Julia the world back. migration is generally less accessible to disadvantaged members of communities including rural agricultural poor and the political or ethnic minorities and yes these are the same groups that are disproportionately affected by climate change because of intersecting vulnerabilities we also know that we cannot conflate all forms of migration in communities because pre-existing conditions matter for migration outcomes for example, our research at the Potsdam Institute with the German cooperation agency GIZ has highlighted that the type of migration practiced by different groups is important for climate migration conflict dynamics. Uh, temporary migration of pastoralists, for example, has often been found to reduce conflict drivers, while longer term changes of residence may increase intercommunal tensions. Um, and I would add to what we heard from Mr. Youssef that uh, people displaced by natural hazard induced disasters often subsequently have a harder time migrating in a way that improves their household resources and it is instead often erosive. So finally then looking inside of the household, the question of migration as adaptation for whom really depends on one's age, gender and position within the household. Uh, at my research at the Potsdam Institute, we find that when only some of the household members move, women and elderly generally choose or ex are expected to stay behind and often fare far worse than before for many of the reasons that Francois uh, raised earlier. And on the other hand, some individuals are deprived of the choice because climate change has eroded their alternative coping mechanisms. Um, I've seen many migrants aged 15 to 25 putting themselves in severe debt to give an ostentatious proof of that they've learned, earned money in their destination area simply because of the enormous pressure that their whole family has invested in their migration project. And in my view, uh, youth around the world don't deserve to both experience climate impacts for their whole lifetimes and also have the burden of migrating as the only way to support their families. 
So coming back to today's question, uh, while I have to say I support migration in general as a transformational force, for us to promote sound strategies for climate adaptation, uh, we need to be really clear-eyed about the elitist and patriarchal systems that got us to the state of global inequality that we are in today. And what matters uh, most is not whether we can attribute migration movements to climate change, but rather that we ensure that migration is a choice and a choice for all. Um, we can try to achieve this through ambitious mitigation, resilience building, and adaptation policies. Thank you again for, for the opportunity. Thank you. Our third round of speakers for the motion will be Kumi Naidu, who's Richard Von V. Sacker Fellow at the Robert Bosch Academy, um, and well known in all sorts of other guises, um, and against Ray Gopher, who's co founder and CSO of Tomorrow.io. So we will begin uh, for, the, for the motion with Kumi Naidu. Thank you very much. Let me start by agreeing with members of the opposition, as we used to say in high school debates, um, that migration is usually a last resort. Uh, as somebody who had to migrate myself or going to exile at a young age, you know that you do it reluctantly, right? You don't want to leave your home. You don't want to leave your ancestors' remains and so on behind. But the question for us right now is that rich nations and the fossil fuel companies that they have supported have delayed action on climate for far too long. And the re reality is that already we have a country like Kiribati in the Pacific leasing land or preparing to lease land from uh, Fiji to relocate the entire country. So let's be clear that the obligation to receive and treat climate-induced migrants with respect, with dignity, and so on, is an obligation that rich nations must take seriously because of their complicity with the fossil fuel companies to delay action on climate. The shifts required are significant. And, and we are now talking about a moment where this decade that we find ourselves in is the most consequential decade in humanity's history. What we choose to do in the next 10 years will determine what kind of future we have or whether we have a future at all. So we should call out right now the criminal acts of behavior on the part of fossil fuel companies and the governments that have supported them, and now is the time for accountability. Migration is not a celebratory act. It is often an act of survival. But also, when we look at the climate issue, we need to recognize that we are dealing with a climate apartheid problem. When we look at those which parts of the world contributed most substantially to the problem and which parts of the world that are paying the first and most brutal price for climate impacts, we got a very uncomfortable demographic picture. Demographic shifts, though, in places like Europe should actually lead Europe to open their arms and say, we will embrace migration because of the aging population and low fertility rates. So basically, I would say that Europe needs migration, for example, uh, because it has a workforce that is shrinking. Uh, Kofi Annan, in a conversation I had with him shortly before he died, reminded me that he had a poster of Albert Einstein on the back of his door at a as a young UN worker which had Einstein with a bag and below it said, when a refugee comes, he comes with more, and she comes with more than what they have on their backs. And let's be clear, migration to Europe has already had one major positive impact, which is it increased the quality of food in Europe considerably. <laughs> so may I conclude then by saying, the shifts required for humanity needs to go deeper and wider too. What we are facing is a convergence of crisis and our preparations for our responses must embrace deep intersectionality. However, in arguing that climate-induced migration is 
a viable adaptation strategy, we need to just pause at the moment and just ask, how is migration happening right now? We do not want climate-induced migrations to suffer the same kind of indignities and the same kind of hardships and burdens that the current migration system actually means for people that are migrating now. And I will remind the people in Europe that the whole immigration refugee laws was to protect people in Europe. If it was good for the people of Europe, surely it's good for the people all around the world. Thank you. Thank you for taking the looming hint. Um, and, um, and finally, against the motion, Ray Gopher. Thank you very much for having me. Um, while I, I don't disagree with many of the points that were made before me, especially the one about the quality of food in Europe, um, I would like to maybe offer a slightly different perspective, uh, and I'm probably the only member of this panel representing the private industry. And so for context, what Tomorrow IO is doing is building climate and weather intelligence solution to help individuals, businesses, and governments better handle their climate-related uh, challenges. And what uh, one angle I would like to offer to this debate is that uh, we uh, developed countries and we private industry can help reduce the impact of climate change on many low-income communities around the globe by providing better solutions, better tools to uh, proactively address those um, challenges ahead of time. And I would like to provide maybe uh, one or two examples that would give some color to that. Um, one example would be around the locust crisis, which uh, I guess if it wasn't for COVID, it would have been the biggest crisis uh, threatening humanity in the last uh, year and a half. Locusts have been around since you know Bible times, but due to climate change, uh, those swarms now become much more frequent and much more aggressive um, because tropical weather in um, sub-Saharan Africa, Eastern Africa, becomes more frequent. Um, and so one would think, well, those, uh, those forms that eat uh, amount of crop the size of Manhattan more or less per day can cause tremendous harm and tremendous uh, then migration um, stresses on communities in East Africa and elsewhere. Um, and that's inevitable, but in fact, uh, there is quite a lot that can be done using modern technology for weather forecasting, for um, alerting using smartphones, using drones, using a lot of different tools we have at our disposal today um, and preventing huge amounts of this damage on the ground, thereby reducing the need to uh, or the stresses on uh, migration patterns. So this is one example out of many how climate uh, resiliency and climate readiness can actually uh, reduce the need. Now, what I maybe some people are not very familiar, but the infrastructure of weather forecasting, which eventually weather is the manifestation of climate on a daily basis, that infrastructure is lacking in most parts of the world that are most susceptible to climate and most susceptible uh, in terms of uh, both the economic and the societal impacts. And this is something we can solve today. And by doing that, we can greatly reduce the stresses. That does not, uh, does not mean that uh, Western countries, developed countries, should not embrace migration if the need is there. Uh, don't, don't get me wrong. All I'm saying is that we can actually help reduce the need for that because eventually people would love to stay where they are and stay with their communities, with their families, um, and with their land and not be forced to migrate. And we can help preventing many of those migrations. Thank you. Thank you, debaters. Thank you to you um, for listening, <clears throat> our audience. I want to turn now to our panel of judges. Um, and they are all going to be on the screen, be behind me. Um, to, to comment on what you have heard, what you didn't hear, what you would like our panelists, uh, what you would have liked our panelists to address, what are the debaters missing um, without declaring a winner? We, we want to hear reflections from, from our judges. Uh, I want to introduce our panel of judges. 
Uh, Miriam Traore Shazal Noel, she is the Senior Policy Officer for the United Nations Migration Agency. She's thought about this issue for a very long time. Zeke Simperingham, who's the lead expert on displacement for the IFRC, the International Federation of Red Crescent and Red Cross Societies. And Vittoria Zanuso, the Executive Director of the Mayor's Migration Council. Judges, you will have three minutes each uh, for your reflections. Miriam, Zeke, and then Vittoria, please. Thank you very much. Uh, hello, everyone. Such a pleasure to be here. Let me specifically comment on the first round of uh, debaters. Uh, they both made excellent points. And at least for me, what comes out of this uh, round of debate is the fact that uh, it all depends. Migration can be an adaptation strategy. It can also create uh, more issues. Francois said uh, migration can be a tragedy and it should be avoided. And he's very right. The majority of people actually do want to uh, stay where they are. I work at the International Organization for Migration. We are speaking to migrants daily in different parts of the world. The vast majority of people do not wish to migrate. So from a policy perspective, and it's great that uh, we are here at the COP, um, for me, uh, one of the priorities is to be looking at how you build resilience in areas of origin of migrants or in areas where we are already seeing trends towards uh, out migration. By focusing on um, addressing structural factors and um, enhancing climate action in these specific areas, then we should be able to avoid the worst of uh, distress migration. But on the other hand, uh, Deb is absolutely right. Um, at this stage, it's not even just about debating whether it's good or not. Migration is happening. It's happening in every part of the world. It's happening in uh, countries with different levels of income. So what do we have to do here? In my view, it's important for the climate policymakers to really keep an eye on what's happening with the migration policymakers. Uh, the UN member states have negotiated something called the Global Compact for Safe, Orderly, and Regular Migration, and this compact has provisions on how you can facilitate concretely uh, migration for people who cannot stay where they are or who cannot return to areas impacted by climate impacts. Concretely speaking, this is about maybe devising new types of visas, thinking about specific uh, temporary protection measures, thinking about specific labor migration opportunities. So I think we cannot uh, avoid thinking about facilitating migration and what does it mean in terms of migration policy making at national, regional and um, global level. So I think all debaters have been excellent in bringing up the key points. Maybe one thing I will add here is that I think it's not too late. I think we should have some hope that uh, there is still time to address these questions that we are not going to be facing as a world mass migration of desperate people and that we all have uh, both the political will and the capacity to address this. With this, I'll stop. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, uh, thank you, Sumini and, and, and the uh, panelists. Uh, I am as the executive director of the Mayor's Migration Council. Today, uh, I'm excited to specifically represent uh, a group of mayors, the mayors of Los, ja Los Angeles, Dhaka, Freetown, and others that uh, this year uh, launched uh, a task force, a mayoral task force to accelerate the global responses on climate and migration. This topic is not very mainstream uh, in this year's COP agenda, so I'm very uh, grateful for this space. So with this uh, city level perspective um, in mind, I'll react to some of the ideas I heard today and maybe I like a bit what I, I didn't hear here and, and what I would like to see uh, more in, in the final uh, closing. So let's start with uh, an argument uh, in favor. Some of you uh, said that it's a matter of um, responsibility and accountability and that responsible countries who cause or, or companies who cause uh, emissions in the first place should open their doors to welcome climate migrants. And this sort of welcoming quota or migration tax, if you wanna be more negative about it, or if you wanna be UN, we can be um, talking more about uh, res you know, responsibility sharing. Um, this makes a lot of sense to me, uh, and it makes a lot of sense in principle. 
But in reality, as some of you said, most climate migrants tend to move closer to home, rarely crossing an international border. So uh, these movements are mostly internal, they're short distance, and I will add a layer to this. They are mostly rural to urban, they affect urban areas. And uh, I'm able to say this because we worked with some of the researchers uh, behind the World Bank Brownswell report to apply their model uh, to the local level and specifically focusing on cities in Mexico and Central America. And what we found is that the majority of people will, mo will move to large cities. For example, by 2050, Mexico City might grow by more than 10 million people due to a combination of climate impacts and barriers uh, to onward migration to the US. So while I think it's fair to push global North countries to pay back uh, by welcoming climate migrants with open borders, as some of you suggested, uh, I also think it would be smart to ask them to invest uh, in those origin countries and those cities specifically that are already and will continue to receive the majority of climate migrants. Now, moving to one argument uh, against uh, the motion, some of you talked about the ugly side of migration and forced migration. Uh, we can specifically talk about relocation and forced relocation, which many times goes wrong and it can increase human rights abuses and, and so forth. So I agree that this is a problem, but I don't think that uh, we should focus on whether relocation is a viable and safe adaptation strategy or not. Maybe we should focus more on how we do it and, and, and what it takes to make it safe and viable. And again, here, surprise, surprise, uh, it's about mayors and cities who can facilitate uh, mobility with, uh, that preserves rights, dignity, and, and assets. So I, I'll stop here because I see we are at time, but I would love uh, if uh, panelists could address this local side of migration and climate. And uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you, everyone. And stay tuned for a special COP announcement from our task force on November 9th next week. Thanks. Um, thank you very much also for the opportunity. Good morning and uh, good afternoon to everyone in the room and everyone watching online. Um, this has been a very interesting and rich debate on a critically important topic. Um, I have three main reflections to make around the debate that also include some, some questions for the speakers, for the teams. The first is a positive. This, is often, this issue is often framed as an issue for the future, an issue that we need to prepare for, an issue that we need to think about by 2050 or by the end of the century. In other words, it's often framed as an issue for future generations. The implication is that this is not an issue for us, but the reality, and all teams have clearly expressed this, that this is an issue for today. This is our issue. So I applaud all teams for recognizing the urgency and the immediacy of this issue. But what we are also seeing, and as the Red Cross and Red Crescent uh, present through 14 million volunteers across the globe, what we are also seeing is this is not an even issue. This is a deeply unequal issue. The impacts are already being clearly felt by already marginalized community, the poorest communities, those already excluded. And what I heard from both teams is a recognition of that. But it was a little bit the framing of the solution. If people are already at risk, then migration can be a solution. But then the other, time, the other team said that because people are excluded, migration is not open as a solution to those communities. I don't see those as necessarily mutually exclusive. So it would be good to hear from the panelists if they are mutually exclusive positions. Uh, the second reflection I have is in order to develop a solution, to propose migration as a solution, we need to very much understand exactly what the problem is we are trying to address. And we have heard many things during the debate today. We have heard the situation in Kiribati, similar situations in Tuvalu, Solomon, other parts of the Pacific, the Maldives, small island developing states. We also heard about disaster displacement connected to mega storms, mega events. We're seeing sudden onset effects, we're seeing slow onset effects. In many ways, these are quite diverse. These are quite complex issues. There is no one type of climate migrant. There is no one type of climate displaced person. So as we develop and propose migration as a solution, I think we do need to look at this issue more holistically and not through the lens of one particular type of movement. And I think that brings me to my final reflection in my final 20 seconds, 
And this is not something that I heard too much, a little bit from the for team and not too much from the against team, but in recognizing this complexity, in recognizing this urgency, in recognizing the need for nuance, we have to have local communities at the center of addressing this challenge. Local communities need to be the strongest voice. They need to create a vision for their future that we can support. Thank you very much. Okay, um, thank you judges for those comments and thank you uh, Zeke for tying those threads together. Now here's what's gonna happen next. Both teams are going to deliberate for a minute and a half to develop their final rebuttal, which they will deliver. One, one representative from each team will deliver. As they do that, you all will be treated to a short video. So, for team, against team, in real life, virtual, you will be talking to each other for one and a half minutes, and I'll see you here shortly. Hello, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us. How can businesses, governments, and individuals collaborate to achieve more inclusion and sustainability? How can we humanize the crisis, tell better stories about the crisis? Today, we're looking at the state of the world's oceans. Thrilled to welcome you to a conversation with experts from around the globe. We need to reduce half of the emissions in the next decade. We need to seek out the opportunities where we can make the biggest changes. Simply taking that straight line and turning it into a circle. Thank you to the audience members who have submitted their questions. The ultimate goal is to have this sense of urgency and this call to action. Thank you very much. Have you selected your representatives for the final remarks? I certainly hope so. Um, who is going to champion the motion and speak in the four team? Would you like to come forward? Take the stick. All right. We got a minute and a half on the clock, I think. All right. Do we have a timer on? Go for it. All right, let's try it. All right. Obviously, it would be better if migration was not happening, but it is happening. And to ensure that we are actually having just and equitable processes that are not reproducing the past, we need to have migration that is planned, that is funded, and that is equitable, that restores past inequities by having countries that have been contributing to the dominant aspect of climate change funding migration areas. What we want to do primarily is we want to avoid desperate migration. We want to ensure that there is hope going forward, that migration happens in intentionally and with care and dignity. And in thinking about this, we want to ensure that frontline communities, communities that are facing these effects of sea level rise, of fire, of displacement locally and internationally, are at the center of that decision making. Thank you. Well, I certainly do agree that migration does happen and does exist. Uh, but at the same time, we need to be realistic and we cannot afford to be naive here. Because how do states adapt to migration? They close their borders. Uh, we're here in the UK, in Calais right now, uh, there are people on hunger strike, migrants on hunger strike, because the UK doesn't want them. Uh, at the US, on the southern border, there is a wall, because the US doesn't want migrants from Central and South America. Uh, there are also walls being built at the borders between Turkey 
and Iran. There is a fence at the border between India and Bangladesh. All of this because richer, wealthier countries do not want migrants from poorer countries. And I'm afraid that if we don't focus primarily on keeping the world inhabitable for the poorest, then we will create more migration flows and more tragedies, more tragedies at sea, more tragedies at the borders. And this is why I think that our responsibility should primarily be to keep the world inhabitable. After all, this is the reason why we're here. Thank you. This is where you come in, our audience. Now that you have heard the final rebuttals on both sides, we want uh, to give you the opportunity to share which side you think has won you over. And we will um, be using a highly scientific method called applause. So, um, Christian? You want to start? Well, let me remind you, the motion is migration is a sound adaptation and reparations strategy. If you agree with those for the motion, please give us your applause now. Those who are against the motion, those who were won over by the other side, please show us your applause. Do we, do, do we actually have a machine that measures the sound here? Or are we supposed to judge this? OK, we're supposed to judge this. I'm not sure that was conclusive, I have to say. I, I must say, I think that um, reflects active listening on your parts. Um, as a parent of a teenager, I, I welcome active listening. Um, want to do a rematch? Well, OK, if you want, let's, let's try a rematch. I suspect we're going to get the same result. But if you're for the motion, applause now. <laughs> and if you're against the motion, All right. Um, <clears throat> I think it's, it's a tie. It's tight. It's, it's a tie. tight. Yeah, yeah. You know, I, it's I, a tie. I, I would say I think this kind of reflects, in a way, um, the, 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 the sort of the, the framing and who we have here debating. Because I, I think, for my part, it's been a fascinating conversation. But what's really struck me over the last nearly an hour or so is that everybody taking part in this debate has effectively been coming from a position of sympathy towards climate migrants. And when this debate hits the real world, and it will, because as we've, as we've been reminded, um, this is already happening, and it will happen in greater, greater pace, there is a whole nother perspective on this debate, which is harsher, nastier, is about anti-immigration, it's about people who do not believe in the right uh, of migrants to flee. They will point out the ambiguity, ambiguities in the International Refugee Convention when it comes to climate change. There is an awful lot in this to sort out, and perhaps that's what's reflected in, uh, in, in, in your response to the motion today. You know, for my part, I really appreciated that the debaters listened to each other and they engaged with the points that they made. Um, I would really invite you, members of the audience, to kind of think about one thing that you heard, at least one thing that surprised you, that you didn't know. And I would really invite you uh, to talk about it amongst yourselves, with people who weren't here, talk about it. Uh, one of the most important things we can do as an informed global citizenry is to talk with each other about climate change, including migration and climate change. So I thank you for your participation, and I thank our, our panelists, both in real life and on the screen. And thank you, Krish, for joining me. Thank you very much.